In this lecture, I'm going to talk about rotational dynamic systems. In your previous dynamics book, you probably saw the equation, which is the equivalent f equals ma, a Newton second law equation in the rotational sense, as the sum of the moments equals i alpha. In this class, we're going to be using that same equation, but just with different terms. So we will have the sum of t equals j times theta double dot, but essentially it's the same equation. So in this case, t is a torque or the moment, j is a moment of inertia, and theta double dot is an angular acceleration. So before we get into solving some problems, I want to remind you of a few of the kind of background pieces of information you'll need to know for modeling and, and analyzing rotational dynamic systems. So one of them is the parallel axis theorem. So for the parallel axis theorem, what it does is it allows you to find the moment of inertia about a second axis. So if you know the moment of inertia about one axis and you know the distance between the axes, then you can find the moment of inertia about the second axis. So let's say, for example, you had a cylinder and uh, let's call the axis running along the center of that cylinder CC. And let's say that cylinder is rolling along some plane, and we want to find out what the moment of inertia is about uh, that contact point between the cylinder and the plane. We'll call that axis XX. So the moment of inertia of a cylinder about its center line is 1 half m r squared, where r is the radius of that cylinder. So if we want to find the moment of inertia about um, that contact line, um, then it's the moment of inertia about the known point plus the mass times the distance between the two axes. So in that case, that would be um, this distance d, which in this example is just the radius of the cylinder. So the moment of inertia about this new axis is going to be 1 half m r squared plus m r squared, or 3 halves m r squared. Okay, so that's a parallel axis theorem. Okay, so let's also talk about some of the different elements that you may want to use in your modeling. So first, let's take a look at springs. Okay, so let's talk about some of the uh, elements that are going to be in your uh, mechanical models for rotational systems. So the first we're going to talk about is a torsional spring. So this is a type of spring that you might see in a watch or a wind-up toy or some other um, machine that uh, requires a shaft to spin. And so just like in a linear spring, if you have a torsional spring, you can look at the relationship between the torque and the angular displacement uh, by using Hooke's law. So here our torque, or a moment, is k, which is our spring constant, times the angle that it's been rotated. So if we want to look at the units for k, we can solve for k, and that's t divided by theta. So t is a torque or a moment, which is a newton meter divided by a radian. So that'll be the units of our, our spring constant. So in this case, we've made the assumption that there's a linear relationship. And so we have this linear slope here, which is uh, equal to k. We can have nonlinear springs too, but remember in dynamic systems, we can all, only solve for linear systems. If you have a nonlinear system, you can either linearize it, which I'll show you later in the class, or you can use Simulink or some, some other numerical method to solve that differential equation. Okay, so let's talk about some of the assumptions for the spring. We're going to make the assumption in this course that the spring is mass. We're going to neglect any energy lost. So what that means is we'll just let the damping elements remove the energy and we'll let the spring elements just store the energy. It's kind of like in circuit analysis if you make the assumption that a resistor um, doesn't have any capacitive effect. Okay, so springs, let's, let's get in a little bit more into that kind of analogy with electrical systems.
So springs in parallel add like resistors in series. For example, if I had a wall and I had two springs, these are linear springs just to show you the concept, and then I was going to apply a force to these two springs. The total spring constant, so if this is spring constant 1 and spring constant 2, the total spring constant would be K1 plus K2. And springs in series will add like resistors in parallel. Okay, so let's talk about a torsional damper. Okay, so a damper is going to be an element that's going to dissipate energy, and it doesn't store energy. We'll also make the assumption here that's massless. Okay, so in this case, if we plot um, the torque as a function of the angular velocity, um, then the slope will be B, which is the damping coefficient. So then we have this relationship that the torque or the moment equals B times theta dot. Okay, in this case, beta equals, or B equals T over theta dot, and the units here will be Newton meters divided by radians per second, or a newton meter second over a radian. Okay, so let's model a rotational system. Okay, so let's assume that we have a cylinder that has a shaft running through it, and this shaft is attached to a bearing or a pillow block on each end. Okay, and this rotates at some omega, where omega is theta dot, or the angular velocity. Okay, so let's take a look at some initial conditions. So, in this case, at t equals zero, we're going to say that omega zero or theta dot zero equals omega zero. Okay, so that, it just has some initial angular velocity. You can think of the system like a flywheel or a system in a regener regenerative braking device in a hybrid vehicle or a flywheel for storage, storing energy or a system to do brake testing. So really, it's just some mass that's been spun up to an initial angular velocity, and we're going to look at the dynamics of that system over time. Okay, so our governing equation is the second Newton's second law, which is the sum of all the torques equals J, which is the um, moment of inertia, times theta double dot, or the angular acceleration. Okay, so theta is angular displacement, theta dot is the same as omega, which is angular velocity, and then theta double dot, which you could write as omega dot, or from your dynamics book, maybe it was written as alpha, that's the angular acceleration. What kind of torques do we have on this system? Okay, so let's, let's say that our system has a brake on it. And we're going to model this brake like a damper. And the reason why we have this minus sign here is that the braking force will act in the opposite direction of motion. So if we're keeping track of theta in the positive direction as whatever direction the system is rotating in, then this torque is going to be counteracting that motion or trying to slow it down. Okay, so let's keep going. That's really the only moment or torque acting on our system. So now we can say that minus b theta dot equals j 
theta double dot. So we could also write this as uh, say by knowing that theta dot is omega and that theta double dot is uh, omega dot, we could rewrite this equation as beta times or d times omega equals j omega dot. Okay, so let's get all of our omega terms on the same side of the equation. Now we have j omega dot plus b omega equals zero and we can divide through by j, so we have omega dot equals b divided by j times omega equals zero. Okay, so we want to solve this thing. And what is that going to tell us when we solve it? Well, it's going to tell us what the angular velocity is of this system over time. So by solving this equation, that's what, what, what we mean. Okay, so let's do that. We know how to solve this. We take the Laplace transform of, of each term. Okay, so that first term is going to be, if we take the Laplace transform of omega dot, we have S omega, so that's capital omega, of S minus the initial angular velocity. Take the Laplace transform of omega, we get omega of S and we have a homogeneous differential equation, so that's all we have. So now we can substitute these in. And we have an s omega of s minus omega zero plus a b divided by j omega of s equals zero. Okay, so now we want to combine our omegas. And so we have omega of s is going to equal omega lowercase omega at some time zero, so that's our initial angular velocity, divided by s plus b divided by j. So you might remember that the inverse Laplace transform of this will be omega of s at some time zero times e to the minus b divided by j t. Okay, so if we were to plot this, so we see, we see we have an exponentially decaying function here. So at some time zero, we're going to start at our initial condition, which is omega zero. And then at some time far in the future, so when t is very large, this term will end up going to zero. So that means this Velo angular velocity is going to do something like this. So if we were to plot the solution to our differential equation, it's going to look something like this. So we're going to get an angular velocity that exponentially decays over time. You may remember from some of your other classes that idea of a time constant. So in this case, our time constant is going to be j divided by b. So that's going to give us units of time. Really what a time constant means is that after one time constant, the angular velocity is going to m have moved about 63 to 64 percent of the way from its initial velocity to its final velocity. Okay, so that's the modeling and using of Laplace transforms to solve the differential equation for a relatively a uh, simple rotational system. Now you can just expand from this point to more complex systems. Maybe you have translational systems that are interacting with rotational systems or more complex input functions. But these are kind of the basics and those are the, the basic steps that you'll take for all of your analyses.